How could the people and the characters involved in the story of the birth of God himself, how could they have possibly known everything that God was accomplishing in that little town called Bethlehem? In many ways, we treat Christmas as a story. And in many ways, it is. Some relegate it to a story of fiction, a story of fable, maybe even just a story of moral good. But it's a story of much more than that. What we witness and celebrate every Christmas is actually the story of God. It's His story. It's His story, how He wanted to insert Himself into human history in order to change the course of the world. It's the birthday that changed the world, and in so doing, it changed our world, and it changed your world. There's a Jewish tradition that teaches that when Eve first ate the fruit, that she obviously became sin and lost her perfection. The Jewish fable comes in, or the Jewish way of telling this is that Adam saw that his wife had become sin and had lost her purity, lost her righteousness. And so he actually ate the fruit willingly. He chose to do it. He actually did it intentionally in order to join his wife. Now, to be honest, that's not really the way the Bible records, and it's probably not the way we would tell that story. However, it is the way we would tell the story of the second Adam. The second Adam saw, Jesus himself saw, that his bride, the people that God always wanted to marry, he saw that humanity had become sin, that they had lost their perfection. And so the son himself, Jesus, he said, you know what, I... I'm going to become sin so that I can join my wife in her death in order that my wife can join me in my life. So in many ways, the Christmas story is actually the grand narrative of salvation. For this to happen, John 1.14 is the verse on which this whole narrative hinges. The Word, God, the Son Himself, Jesus Christ, became flesh. God, God became human and He dwelt among us. He wanted to be with us. Do you know there's two names that we celebrate around this time? The first one is that of Emmanuel, and that in itself is just a mind boggling concept that God wants to be with us. Do you know God wants to hang out with you? God wants to be in your life. He wants to be in your moments. This, this idea that God is, is off somewhere in the, in the far off galaxy, in a, in a heaven far flung way away from human existence is just not true to what the Bible records about the character and the nature of God. The character and the nature of God portrayed in the story of salvation is that He is a father, is that He is a husband, is that He is a personal being that wants to be intimate with us. He wants to be intimate with you. Hence why the prophecy about the child being born and the son being given is that His name would be Emmanuel, God with us. If you ever heard me talk about the name Emmanuel, you will hear me say that I believe it's God's favorite name about Himself. He loves that name, Emmanuel, because it is very much part of His heart, His character, His nature, is that He wants to be among us. He wants to dwell with us. He wants to be intimate with us. He wants to dwell in our every moment. The second name that, that the angel told Mary to actually name the baby that she was going to carry was that of Jesus. And Jesus, you may be familiar with the idea that the name Jesus is defined as salvation. That would be very, very true, very accurate. But probably a better rendering of the name Jesus is God, our salvation. That really is the good news right there. Is that the salvation that we experience is not of our own works. 
It's Jesus who is our salvation. It's not because you performed well. It's not because you were good. It's not because you were holy. It's not even because you deserved it. It's because God, our salvation, Yeshua, Jesus, He's the one who made us worthy in order for Him to be Emmanuel in our lives. And so it very much is your story. It's very much my story. But in actual fact, this is really God's story. God's story is that He created humanity so that He can dwell with them, hang out with them, be with them, not be distant, but but actually be there. We just heard a song about Mary. Did you know that you were carrying God Himself? Did you know that what you carried brought salvation not only to your own life, but to your nation, and not only just your own nation, but to the world, and not only just the world, but all humanity that ever lived, and all humanity that was ever about to live, that you carried the salvation of all humanity in you? Well, at Christmas time, this is a really great time for us to reflect on a very similar question. Do you know that it's possible, and indeed, if you've said yes to Jesus, that you carry God Himself in you? That salvation Himself lives in you. That peace Himself lives in you. That the healer Himself lives in you. That the idea that God came up with at the beginning of the universe was for there to be no separation between God and humanity but that their spirits would be intertwined one with another, that you couldn't tell where God stopped and humanity started. That's the idea that God always had with His family. And now each one of us could ask that same question. Do you know what you carry in your spirit? Because the fullness of God's spirit has now indwelt with you. Why? Well, because they came up with a plan. And the plan involved Christmas. The plan involved the Son becoming flesh and dwelling among us. And it says in 2 Corinthians that He who knew no sin became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God. That in itself is just a concept that may actually take us an eternity to comprehend. That God, righteousness Himself, holiness Himself, goodness Himself became sin. Not just carried our sin, not just had our sin laid upon Him, but more than that, He became sin. Every single thing that separated us from God, Jesus took it in His spirit. He took it in His body. He became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God. You are the righteousness of God. It's not on you. It's just not in your head. It's not something that you become. Christ has made you His righteousness so that there is no longer any separation between you and holiness Himself. Let us not underestimate the story that we're celebrating over these next couple of days. The fact that the King has come to live in us, that the King Himself has come to live in us, through us, that the King Himself has called us His righteousness, that we stand with God, co-heirs in the kingdom, sons and daughters. The Apostle John, reflecting upon this as an older man, John walked with Jesus as a teenager, but as a much older man, looking back on his life and looking back on his relationship with Jesus, he sums it up brilliantly with the line that he says, Behold! What manner of love is this, that we would be called the children of God? That invitation has been around for 2,000 years, and I'm about to extend that invitation to you this morning. If you've never known that God is personal to you, that God's desire and His heart is to be in your world, that God Himself hinged all of human history around the moment in time in which He came to dwell and tabernacle and be with us. And that there is an open invitation for you to say, I want to dwell with you too, God. I want to be in your world. Then right now, I'm going to give that invitation to you for you to say yes to. And remember, His name is Jesus, God 
our salvation. It's not your salvation. It's not your works. You might say, well, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not rich enough. I'm not holy enough. I've done bad things. I've, I've made a mess of my life. You don't understand how worthless I am as a person. There is no way God could possibly love me. That is just not the case. God loves you so ridiculously, so passionately, so immensely. He literally gave up heaven in order to take upon sin so that you could give up sin in order to take on his heaven. And just like every one of us is going to do on Christmas Day, the only thing needed and required to receive this gift is just to take it, just to receive it, not to question it, not to say, oh, I'm not worthy of these Christmas presents. No, the greatest Christmas present that was ever given was Jesus himself. And all you got to do is take it. 